Let's stand together. My name is Tyler. I want to welcome you today. Thanks for being here. I want to welcome everyone who's watching online. And uh, how many of you heard this new song on Facebook this week? Awesome. Be sure and check that out. So let's sing together. We just want to declare God's love. Let's sing. Before I call, before I ever cry, you answer me from where the thunder hides. I cannot run this hard I'm tethered to. With every step I collide. Turn, I come face to face with you. second that goes by let's sing this together you chase me down you seek me out how could I be lost you have called me out you chase me down you seek me out how could I be lost you have called me out you chase me
sometimes I think the reality is, I know, I know for me, is I don't consciously think about this a lot, but every day really walking in this truth that God loves me. And, uh, and also as, as I respond to him, really thanking him daily for his love and what it means. And we're gonna, we're gonna look at it more in scripture here in a minute. But uh, maybe in this moment, I just ask you to have a seat and just change things up a little bit. And we'll just, we're just gonna play and uh, a scripture is gonna come on the screen. This is Psalm 86. And uh, maybe you can meditate on this and pray it. But I just ask you in this moment, let's just, let's take a moment by ourselves and, and just reflect and thank God for his love. Thank him for his faithfulness. And if you question that, if you're not sure about that, Ask him to show you. I, I know he's faithful to do that. So we're just gonna play for a little bit and let's just sit in this moment and we'll come back and sing here in a minute. God, I thank you for this truth that you are merciful and you are gracious. You, you give an abundant supply of yourself for the need of the moment. Thank you for that. And that even when we're fast to anger, you're slow to anger and you're abounding in love more than we can fathom. We thank you that you are faithful and steadfast. And I pray that every one of us in this place and those of you that are watching online and those in Odessa and those in North, that we would know today this truth deeply rooted in our hearts. I thank you that we get to gather here as a group of people who are broken and need you, but God, your love is ever present. And I thank you that we can, uh, we can encourage one another and speak truth and love to each other. We love you this day in Jesus' name. I pray, amen. So I know that you haven't been uh, seated very long, but I ask you just to stand with us again. And we just wanna to respond together with this truth and really sing it to each other. There's not a day he hasn't left any one of us behind. So let's sing. And there won't be a day that you're not by our side. There won't be a day that you let us fall and all of our life your love will be true so all of
breaks the power of sin and darkness Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the King of glory, the King above all kings. Come on, church, and sing. This is amazing. Yeah. This is Jesus, that you will bear my cross. You together with our faith family. You guys can have a seat. My name is Dustin. Uh, I minister in our next generation ministry here at Stonegate. And we just want to welcome everyone here. Uh, those who are with us in Odessa and at our North venue as well. Thank you guys for choosing to spend your day with us. Just a few things that we want to let you know about that are going on around our campus. I mean, first of all, here in the moment, as we pass around the baskets, we want to let you know that you can give not only here physically, but also in the foyer. Uh, there's an electronic kiosk, but then online as well at stonegatefellowship.com, various ways that you can give. Just want to make sure everyone knows about those. 
We also want to let you know whether you've been here for the very first time today or you've been here for a little bit, whether it's a few months or a few years, we have a Start Here card that's in the seat back in front of you. And really the purpose of that card is we want to take this really big auditorium and make it small again. And we want to help you connect, whether that's in groups or maybe that's through serving or in a class, something like that. Uh, we want to help you connect. Connection is one of our key core values here. So use that Start Here card. You can drop it off in the basket or you can give it to someone at the information desk when you leave here in just a little bit. Uh, camp is coming up, which is kind of crazy to say in February, but it is. Uh, camp is coming up. I'm just going to leave it there. And it's a big deal to us here at Stonegate. Uh, today is the second day where you can, uh, the second week where you can sign up for camp. And so what we're asking is that right now you begin to prayerfully consider who needs to sign up. Is it my kids? Is it my friend uh, or friends of my kids? Is it cousins, grandkids, the kids in the neighborhood? Who is it? Who needs to go to camp this year? We're asking you to prayerfully think about that because the next generation ministry of Stonegate has two camps. One camp for those who finished fourth and fifth, they're going to go to Glen Rose. And those who just finished sixth all the way through just graduated high school are going to go to Glorietta. So do you know a kid in those age ranges that need to go to camp? And if so, uh, you are open and ready to start signing them up right away. And the reason camp's a big deal is because it's the only time uh, during our whole time with them that we get a week to pour directly into their life, to show them Jesus and to help them live a life of influence. So if you are here on this campus, go to Stone Mart and, and talk to them about what are my next steps to begin signing up. If you're in Odessa, go to your welcome area and they'll help get you situated as you begin to sign up. But there's another piece to that. Maybe beyond signing a kid up for camp, maybe you need to sign yourself up for camp. Maybe it's time, maybe this is the year where you begin to take that next step toward pouring into the next generation through service, whether as a small group leader, a rec person, safety team, hospitality, it doesn't matter. What does that look like for you? So be praying through those opportunities. Go see someone in the appropriate area when you leave here today. And uh, let's get excited because June 4th through the 9th and then the following week are coming up before we know it. All right? Well, Patrick is coming up probably right behind me here, and he's going to start our brand new series, Letter from an Elder. Well, uh, good morning. It's good to be uh, with you. Uh, thanks for letting me be away last week as we married off our baby girl and all that good stuff. So I may just spontaneously break into tears. So, uh, anyways, that was a fun time. And uh, it's uh, good to be with you. If you have a copy of the scriptures, uh, turn to uh, the book of Ephesians. And we're going to get our start there. Kind of turning a corner here and uh, this, the title of the series, this letter from an elder, comes from the fact that uh, over the next few weeks we'll be digging into the book of 1 John, but we'll get our start in the book of Ephesians and Revelation because the letter we're going to be paying attention to is from the elder John who, who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John as well as uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, so we're going to be looking at a church in a place called Ephesus. You're probably familiar with the book of the Bible called Ephesians, and that's where we're going to get our start. Let me give you a little bit of history, and I'm just kind of diving right in. I'd love to talk more about camp, as Dustin just mentioned that, but you know how I feel about camp if you've been here for a long time. Any of you out there who thought, um, who you're thinking, you know, I think what I'll do is I'll just sign up for uh, security rather than anything else. Uh, it's probably better to be a counselor, um, I'm just telling you, so before you cop out in that regard. A little bit about the church at Ephesus, just so you can have some background, because that's the church we're going to be looking at. If you kind of go along the journeys of the Apostle Paul, about chapter, and you can go back and read it if you'd like, I'd pick up in about Acts chapter 17, and you started reading, you'd see Paul show up in this place called Ephesus. Ephesus is to the west of Jerusalem. Jump on a boat, head on over to the west. You'd, you'd go to this place called Ephesus. If you uh, took off from Ephesus and, Ephesus and kept going west, you'd run right into uh, Philippi and then on into uh, Rome. But the city of Ephesus was a, a major uh, commerce area. It was very influential. It was a powerful city as cities go. It had the population, uh, really kind of the Midland-Odessa area, as best we can tell. 
a very, very um, wealthy area, and when the gospel showed up, and you can read this on your own, we don't have time to cover the whole thing this morning, when, when people started coming to Jesus in the city of Ephesus, it changed the city. I mean, homes were being changed, families were being changed. As a matter of fact, the Bible will tell you in the book of Acts that businesses were being changed. As a matter of fact, it was being changed so much that they were starting to run some of the disciples out of town because it was changing the ethics of business and different things like that. So in the book of Acts, we read about this church that gets planted, for lack of a better term, that gets started in this city called Ephesus. We'll call it the church at Ephesus. The book of the Bible is Ephesians. And then later on, uh, the Apostle Paul writes a letter to this church. So kind of get your timetable. You know, Jesus is on the earth till about 33, 34, maybe 35 AD, depending on how the numbers all work out. Paul starts a ministry after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And then this church at Ephesus is started. And this church at Ephesus gets a letter later on from the Apostle Paul maybe around 50, 60 AD. You know, it's, it's hard to pinpoint a date because we're not told in the scriptures when the date was, but it's important you understand the timeline because it's going to matter when we get to the book of Revelation. So look at Ephesians chapter 2 with me, and I'm not going to read it verse by verse by verse because we need to jump ahead to the book of Revelation. I just want to give you an idea of what's happening, and, and so you can kind of follow along, because when we read the letter called Ephesians, we see no indication that anything is wrong in the church at Ephesus. It's, it's growing, it's an established church, but there's no indication whatsoever they're in danger. And, and so that's going to be important, because over the last several weeks, we've talked about what it would mean for us to be a church that wins. Now, if you haven't been with us over the last few weeks, and you hear the preacher talking about winning Please go back and listen to some of the messages so you can catch up and know what we mean by that. But the church at Ephesus is a winning congregation, okay? And so look with me in chapter 2, and this is somewhat of a well-known passage. If you don't know it well, I don't want you to feel like you're stupid or whatever, so I hesitate to say that. But in chapter 2, verse 1, just let me read some of these verses. Paul says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience. So he's talking about who we were before we came to Jesus. Now skip down to verse four. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, tuck that away in your mind because it's gonna matter a little bit later on, that Paul just said, God was rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Just remember that, okay? Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And then if you skip on down to verse eight, maybe you've heard this verse before. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, this free gift of salvation. Not a result of works or anything that you could do so no one can boast. Now remember that, okay? So he's talking about love. He's talking about you can't, you're not loved because of what you do or the works you have done. You're saved completely by grace. You're kept by grace. And then if you look with me in verse 11, okay, because he's going to change the topic here. And I want you to read with me in verse 11. Just follow along. He kind of changes course. And he says, therefore... Remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Verse 12, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. And then go to verse 13. Again, I'm kind of skimming. Don't, don't worry about that. Okay, don't think he's skipping the word of God. I'm just giving you uh, kind of where we're headed. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, those of you who once were far off and far removed, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So understand the message. Here's this church. They've been planted. They've turned the city upside down because of Christ in their lives. Paul tells them they were loved by him. That's, the, that's how they got saved, because of love that, that gave way to grace. And then in verse 11, he says, but you need to remember where you've come from, okay? Now, 
Let me give you this little phrase, and then we're going to turn over to Revelation chapter 2. I'm just going to read it from my notes. You cannot love well or even live well until you know how much you are loved. Okay? You cannot love well until you know how much you are loved. And, and I'll talk about this some more a little bit later on, but I, I just want you to understand that as we press into the scriptures here, you're going to learn that one of the greatest struggles each of us have in loving other people is not really because of the people we're trying to love. It has more than anything, it, it has to do with the fact that I really haven't understood how much I'm loved. Because out of how much I'm loved is the supply that allows me to love others. Now, I said a lot there. Don't get confused and, and don't think, oh my goodness, he's going to have to explain that. I'm never going to get it. We'll get it a little bit later, okay? So turn over to Revelation chapter 2. Turn over to Revelation. You're just going to go to the right if you're in Ephesians, almost to the very back of the Bible. Well, it's the last book of the Bible, just before that highly inspiring book of concordance. And so if you will go to some of you are like, what did, did that mean? Um, never mind. So Revelation chapter 2, again, John is writing this. He's in prison on the island of Patmos. I know those of you who have just moved here to the Permian Basin may think you're in prison, but it's not. It's a wonderful place. You'll learn to love it, and um, you will also learn that right after a beautiful day comes a day like today, and that just sort of happens for a while. But um, So we get to Revelation. Now, Revelation as a book was probably written around 90 AD, okay? Now, give or take, you know, when you're talking about thousands of years ago, you can be off a few years and you're okay. So around 90-something, remember the history I've told you. So the book of Acts, the church at Ephesus is planted. It turns into a powerhouse of a church, a winning congregation, you could say. The apostle Paul writes them a letter, a little bit later on in their history, tells them a little bit of theology and some things to do. If you were to read the book of Ephesians, you would find out that chapters 1, 2, and 3 are fairly theological, and chapter 4, 5, and 6 are fairly applicational. Now, a generation, or possibly two generations, have passed through this church at Ephesus. Now, why is that important? Because we've just spent the last several weeks talking about what it means for us as a church to win, and we don't win unless we pass on something that is sustainable for generations to come. And so now, John, who's in prison on an island, gets a vision from the Lord, and he writes a letter that is to be read to the church at Ephesus. So let's look at chapter 2, and it's a warning. Chapter 2, verse 1, and just follow along with me, and these verses will come up on the screen, but hopefully you're using a copy of the scriptures as well. Verse 1. A lot of things going on here in verse 1. We don't have time to define as far as how you read Revelation, so just I'm going to read it. And if you want to find out more about it, that's going to have to come at another time. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Probably best just, just to say these, this is Jesus giving you these words. Verse 2. I'm going to read all this, and I'm going to go back and, and do what I've done before in the past, and that is give you some understanding of what these words mean. So verse 2, I know your works, I know your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. So verse 2, he's, I know all about this. Verse 3, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you haven't even grown weary. But let me tell you what I have against you, verse 4. Let me tell you what I have against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. Now, it's interesting. He talks about the works they've done. Then he says there's some works you need to return to. We'll come back to that. Do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, Verse 5, you can kind of read it this way. If you do not repent, I'm leaving. That's essentially what, that is what Jesus is saying to them. If you do not change your mind, which means then you change your actions, I'm leaving. Now here's the part you need to get your mind wrapped around as we begin to unpack the details of these words. This church was doing 
everything right. They had it down. Game on, winning. They did, they were impeccable in the things they were doing. And yet, Jesus says to them, I'm leaving unless you return to love. Now let's press into that because the scary thing is, is this church, Stonegate Fellowship in Midland and in Odessa, first hour we had 70 people watching online, we have people in the North venue, all over this community. By the time it's over, both online and around the world, we will have preached to, been listened to, or viewed by over a quarter of a million people. And we can have game on and do everything right. We can take over 1,500 people to camp again this year. We can send missionaries around the world, which we do and which we continue to do. We can have a children's ministry that is just amazing. We can have a parking ministry that just makes you feel welcome and feel guilty for fighting on the way to church or whatever the issue is. We can have donuts. Someone today told me we should probably serve bacon at the noon hour. <laughs> Maybe that makes some of you change services. And so we could just game on. And yet this church called Ephesus, game-winning church, the Lord says to them, unless you get back to love, I'll leave, which carries with it the reality that you can keep winning, but without love, he walks. Now, let me go into some depth about these words so you can understand the depth of what he's talking about, about their behavior. So let's look at that first set of words where he says, I know your works. Verse two, he says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. And then he talks about how you cannot bear evil people. Look at the definitions there. When he talks about working and toil and patient endurance, it means they're working hard, they're doing all the right things, and they're staying after it. I mean, this is a church that, I mean, Odessa has nothing on them. They, even Odessa's rolling things in the building and setting up and all that kind of stuff, and, and you guys are busy, and I see all you people in red shirts, which means you're, you're working in the children's area, and we got people that are ushering and people that are serving, and I mean, he's saying to this church, you work, and, and the words for work and toil are what you would think they are. It's exhausting. You're staying after. It's more than just mental work. It's you are physically invested. And that's what he's saying to this church who's trying to do life in a Roman territory where Christianity is under persecution. You guys stay after it. And it, it gathers on itself when he says, I know your works, your toil, and patient endurance. It carries with it the idea that you keep after it and you keep after it and you will not quit. So when people look at them, they say, that group of people, they just keep on going. And, and let's keep pressing in. He says, I even know that you cannot bear with those who are evil. Now, you can look at the words on the screen. It means they will not sustain or even tolerate evil or the practice of evil. Quite literally means not only do they do the right thing, but you can count on them being able to tell you what's bad, what's evil. I mean, this church has got it going on when it comes to good and bad. I mean, you could come up to them and say, hey, is this bad? And they would go, that's bad. And, and if you needed an opinion about what's bad, what's good, you could show up at the church at Ephesus and they would tell you. Some of us grew up in that church. You didn't know anything that was right, but you sure knew what was evil. And you burnt those albums and then you bought them again later. <laughs> now let's just keep pressing in. He says, uh, as you, if you keep reading, he says, you have tested, still verse two, those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false. I know you're in, you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my, my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. So the next three phrases will come up on the screen. He says, you guys test teachers. That means this is a hard church to preach in. If you show up and you tell this church, I have a message, and they let you preach, well, they're going to either prove you wrong or approve of you. If you want to know who to listen to, you go to the church at Ephesus, and they will say, listen to that person, but not that person. It, they, they test people. They know right from wrong. They know the message. They know who's preaching the Bible. Game on. They're winning. I mean, quite a resume so far. Fighting the fight. Never exhausted. No good from evil. They don't let anybody teach them who doesn't teach them the right thing. And he says this. 
You bear up for the sake of Jesus' name. So I gave you the definition there. Boldly holding forth the name and the cause of Jesus. This is the church that when the world's going to hell in a handbasket around them, they can stand there and go, but we stand for the name of Jesus. We stand for him. Say what you want. We have the t-shirt. We stand for Jesus. When people ridicule you, you stand up and say, bring it on. Game on. They're doing it right. John is writing them a letter and he says, I applaud you that you stand up for the name of Jesus. Way to go. Keep going, team. And then he says this, and you haven't grown weary. I mean, they already know this. They haven't fainted. They haven't stopped laboring. There's no sign of fatigue. In other words, he's not writing the letter to this church because they're about to quit. If there's ever a church that's fighting the fight, if there's ever a church who's, who's Hymn of, of, they sing every week is, Onward Christian Soldiers, right? I mean, they marching off to war, and, and they're just, yes, that's us. I mean, they've got bumper stickers, they've got everything, and they're going to keep fighting. They're winning. They're winning. And then he says this, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned your first love. Now, before we go any further, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. For those of you trying to think of something romantic for two days from now, um, you could go to 1 Corinthians 13 and write a note to your beloved telling them that this is how you love them. I hate Valentine's Day. Um, if they need to know one day of the year you love them, you got problems. So anyways... We go to 1 Corinthians 13, because now we have to get our arms around this issue, because there are many of us in this room who, when we hear the preacher, or a preacher, talking about doing the right thing, but the Lord working, walking away, unless we love, it starts tilting to the gushy. But let's, let's make sure what we understand here and what's going on here. Because he says, you're doing all the right stuff, but you've walked away from love, and you've got to get back to it. And begin thinking the following thoughts that I told you earlier. I don't love the way I should love because I have forgotten how I'm loved. And also remember this. Everything we read about love to the church that's written to the church is not the kind of love we're just simply supposed to give each other who are followers of Jesus. In fact, even more so, it's the kind of love we're to have towards people who reject Jesus. You see, Jesus said, what good is it if you love the people who are your friends? Even pagans do the same thing. But I'm telling you to love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you. You see, what happens is you forget how you're loved, and then you get judgmental to the world. Rather than remembering that he loved us when there was nothing lovable in us. Romans 5, Romans 8, and then when we remember how much we're loved, we give away our lives in love. So look at me in 1 Corinthians 13. Let's just make sure we understand the depth of this. Remember what we heard about the church at Ephesus, did all the right things, said all the right things, taught all the right things. Chapter 13, verse 1, Paul, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I would submit to you the reason, let me say it a different way. I would submit to you that the church today sounds like a bunch of noisy cymbals to the watching world, which is part of the reason we've lost our voice and influence and why the word evangelical means nothing. Paul says, I could speak with the tongues of men and angels. Without love, I'm just making noise. It gets even more serious. If I have prophetic power, and I understand all mysteries and everything there is to know. That means I can tell you a prophetic truth. I can tell you what's going to happen in the world, what's going to happen with Russia, and what's going to happen with China, and what's going to happen with America. I mean, I'm a prophet. And he says, if I have prophetic powers, and I even understand all the answers, and if I have faith that moves mountains, I mean, think about that. Let that just sink in. Think about that kind of life, that kind of church. Right answer, right behavior, and if you need someone to pray for you, th that group moves mountains. 
But if I have not love, I'm nothing. Not just barely missing it, Zippo. That's a lighter. Zilch. Watch this. If I give away everything that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, that means I am willing for you to shoot me dead because I do not grow weary in suffering for the name of Jesus. I can do it right, but I don't have love. I gain nothing. All I'm doing is reading the Bible to you. Verse 4. Remember, Jesus said, this is what we're supposed to show to our enemies. Love is patient and kind. It doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It isn't irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. That's true. But it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Now he's going to go back to what he just said just to make sure we get it. Verse 8. As for prophecies, they will pass away. I hope you understand that in the New Testament, we get to the New Testament, it doesn't matter if you can figure it out or not or someone's right about the future, if the church loses love, God leaves. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they will stop. Knowledge will pass away. And here's why this is so important to Paul and why it has to be so important to us and get back to this love issue. Because at best, all we're able to see is barely anything. This is what he says. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. We we still don't know the whole story. But when perfection comes, in other words, when Jesus shows up, the partial passes away. Then he says this, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I grew up, when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. In other words, trying to be right and doing all the right things is a childish thing. But love is the mature thing. So he goes on to say, Verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I just know things in part. Then I'm going to know fully, even as I am fully known. Please understand, regardless of what you think about yourself, God knows every square inch of you, past, present, and future, and loves you unreservedly and deeply. I'm telling you, your greatest struggle to love comes from your greatest struggle of being loved. You wonder why marriage one, two, and three didn't work? It's because you still don't know how you're loved. You wonder why relationships are always ending up on a rocky side with you? It's because you do not know how much you're loved. And and so it keeps going. It says, so now faith, hope, love, all these, this is all happening. All of these three abide. But the greatest of these is love. Now, let me have you look at one more passage of Scripture, and then we'll finish up here. Keep going to the right. You already know where the book of Revelation is. So if you're at Revelation, you want to go left. If if you're in 1 Corinthians, you want to go right and go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. I'm just going to start reading in verse 18. It says... There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now, before I read verse 19, I hope you've already made your way there. There are many of us in this room who grew up in church, and part of growing up in church was getting saved. I'll use that term because you know that term from growing up in church getting saved out of fear. The evangelist came to town or the preacher showed up and he preached a message about the truth of hell, totally biblically true. And then he told you that if you don't want to go to hell and burn forever where the worm doesn't die and you constantly suffer, you need to beat a path down here and get saved. He kind of squeezed in the fact that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son But I had someone come up to me after the first service and said, hey, by the way, I grew up in that church. When I was five years old, an evangelist came to town. This is a true story. It happened right right out there. He said, and he had a deal on stage with a little G.I. Joe on it. 
And he said, he was using that G.I. Joe, and he said, this is like some of you, and he has the G.I. Joe walking across the stage, and some of you are like, what's a G.I. Joe? So that's a whole nother deal. And, and then all of a sudden, a trap door opens, and G.I. Joe falls in, and he lights this butane thing, and it burns up G.I. Joe, and he says, this is going to happen to you unless you get saved. <laughs> Don't act like that you're surprised. My nose is running. But because that's, even though he didn't use G.I. Joe in your church, that's the image you got sometimes. And, and I'm, I'm not saying you're not saved. I just want you to hear me carefully. Because there are many of us who got saved out of fear and never comprehended love. You've heard that God loves you, but your entire life has been spent in the fear of God's punishment rather than in the joy of being loved by him. And those kind of people do everything right for all the wrong reasons. Because if I don't do it right, God might, I wonder if you could finish the sentence. If I don't do it right, God might what me? Punish me. And so in verse 19, he says this. He says, we love because he first loved us. So let me go back to my notes, and you remember in Revelation chapter, thank you so much, you are amazing. That a girl. Do I have anything hanging there? Okay. Man. All right. So Revelation chapter two, he says, unless, he says, you have left your first love. Now let me show you the definition of that. I know it seems pretty obvious, but you need to see the magnitude of these terms. When he says you have left your first love, if you were to translate it into hard English, this is what it would read. You have left first of its kind and one of a kind love. The word for first in this passage is where we get our word prototype. So there's never been anything like it. That's what he's saying. You have left a love that the world's never seen. You have walked away from a love that has, that has no compare, and yet you've walked away from it. You've left this one-of-a-kind love. And the word for leaving has several definitions. Let me show you this. It means you've let it go. You've left it alone. You've disregarded it, dismissed it, relaxed it, allowed it to become less intense. And Paul uses the same word for left it that he uses for divorce when he says in 1 Corinthians, husbands who have divorced their wives. Now, I have counseled a lot of people in the last 18 years. This month is my 18th year celebration here. I've sat across from a lot of couples. Now, listen to this. Thank you, you three people. I, I want to tell you. <laughs> and here's what I hear oftentimes when I sit across a couple who's in crisis. Typically, it's the guy. If it's the lady in your place, I, but I'm just pick on the guy for a minute. They're on their last rope. And I'm the last hope. You know, if we go see Patrick, maybe it'll change. Or whatever it is. And this is what he says. I have provided for you for 30 years. You have never lacked a thing. I have protected you. I have purchased for you. I have given you everything you've asked for. I have made sure you are safe. I have made sure we all drive good cars and have Michelin tires because the commercial says that keeps you safe. I've sent my ch our children to the best schools. I've never cursed at you. I've never yelled at you. I have been home as much as possible. I have learned to do all the right things. And about that time, in some version of that story, she stops him. And she says, can we just stop for just a minute? We're not here because of what you do. We're here because sometime a long time ago, you forgot to love. And he says, what are you talking about? Look at what I've finished the word. Done. And you can put the shoe on the other foot. It can be her saying all the right things. And the other person says, but somewhere along the line, you left love. And it doesn't matter what I do in that session. They will divorce and try to figure out what happened. 
And it has nothing to do with behavior. It has everything to do with leaving love. Now I want to invite you to turn to Ephesians again. I want to show you something. Because remember what he says to this church. You do the right thing. You do the right thing. You hate evil. You despise false teachers. You keep fighting. You keep working. You're the winning team. You win. You win. You win. You win. You win. But you have left love. And he says, you got to change your mind. He uses this word repent, which means to see it, recognize it, change your mind, head the other direction. And he says, repent and return to your first love and do those works again. Doesn't mean you sit around and go, ah, oh, peace, love, and rainbows. Let's not do anything. It means love does something. And what love does is it pursues its enemies. And it loves people. But just so you can see how important this is, now we're going to turn to application. What are you and I supposed to do about this? Well, Paul gives us an idea of what to do in Ephesians chapter 3. And, and here's what I mean. You're not going to be able to walk out of this room and go, man, I am so loved, game on. Not going to happen. Because something deeply spiritual has to happen in your soul for you to understand how much you're loved. And for many of us who grew up in church, the idea of being captured by how much he loves me is going to take a miracle to get me beyond feeling like I have to perform for him to love me. So in Ephesians chapter 3, Remember, we started here, the letter to the church at Ephesus. What I'm going to give you is a prayer to pray, okay? And that's the application. You cannot walk out of this building and do something to apply this message. Something has to happen in your heart and mind to live out of love again. Because Stonegate Fellowship, we can win. And God can walk away. Now listen, and you can keep winning but he's gone. And somewhere along the line, a community will say, you guys do all the right things, but I don't sense love. So in Ephesians chapter three, here's the prayer. Now, this is so important that just before the apostle Paul moves to application, here's the prayer he prays. For a church that he told to remember where they've come from and that a generation later is gonna get a letter that says they forgot this. Ephesians 3, verse 14. So he says, this is why I bow my knees before the Father. That's, that's Paul's way of saying, this is so important to me that I'm falling on the ground begging God for you. That's what that means. That doesn't mean he's sitting at the table going, dear Heavenly Father. It means he's on the ground begging for you. Okay, and This is what he's begging. He reminds them, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. If you ever need to hear a message about how... Um, the, the church can never, ever be racist, then you must read verse 15 and realize that every color, tribe, stripe, whatever, have been created by God. It doesn't matter whether you like them or agree with them. He created them. They're human beings, and you better love them. Doesn't mean agree with them, but it means you better love them. Got to go on. Verse 16. That according to the riches of his glory. What does that phrase mean? It means according to everything God has. So listen to what Paul's doing. He's begging for you, and he's praying that according to everything that God has and everything he is, he would grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit inside of you. I hope you remember that when you ask Jesus to save you, he put his spirit in you. So Paul is saying you need the Holy Spirit to do this in you. Remember I said there's nothing you can do out there, but there is one thing you can do, and that is to pray this prayer over your life and over the lives of your children and loved ones. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, here it is, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Interesting, he doesn't say rooted and grounded in truth first. He says, I'm praying, I'm begging God by the spirit inside of you that you would be rooted deep, grounded in love. Check this out. And you would have the strength that's supplied by the Spirit. Remember, we just read it. That you would have the strength to comprehend, come to an understanding, begin to understand with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height 
in the depth of what? To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Fascinating phrase. It means you cannot even begin to understand how much he loves you. Your starting point and your ending point are barely the beginning of the point of how much God loves you. You would be able to comprehend this breadth, length, height, and depth and know the love of God or Christ that surpasses knowledge. Now watch this. That you may be filled with the fullness of God. You want to be filled with everything that God is? Then you start praying. He show you how much he loves you. And then, here's the interesting thing. Verse 20, he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think according to the power at work within us, you want to do the right things? The power that works within us is the spirit that shows us how much he loves us. Then when we know how much we are loved, we do the works. That's what John said in Revelation chapter 2. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. So you want God to be glorified in his church? You want the church to last for generations and generations? Then we better become a church that hits our knees, puts our faces in the carpet or the hardwood floor, and says, God, show me how much you love me. Some of you have cried out for him to save you so many times you can't remember. And he saved you the first time you cried out. What he's waiting for you to ask is for you to ask him to show you how much he loves you. And when a church starts being captivated by dominated by how much he loves them, you don't have to pray for revivals. You don't have to beg God to change cities. Because when you get a bunch of people filled up with the power of the Spirit, understanding how much they're loved, it changes environments. Folks, we can do everything right. But if we don't know how much we're loved, he walks away. Let's pray together. Whether you're in Odessa or our North Campus or here after the service, we have people down front who would love to pray with you, help you know what it means to be a follower of Jesus. On the main campus, you know there's a prayer room behind the bookstore if you need a little more time. Father, thank you for your word. Open our eyes to meditate on it and, and discover wonderful things from your word more and more. May we, each one, spend time today and maybe even the rest of this week remembering Ephesians chapter 3, that you would give us the ability to know how much you love us. A love that transcends knowledge, but we know that you want to give us. I hope we as your church will do right things. But I, my desperate plea is that we would be known more for a people who, are, who have been captivated by the love of Jesus than for what they do. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a, uh, a great afternoon. Hopefully we'll see you next week.